Welcome back to the Rich Eisen Show. I am Jay Feely, that former kicker who got fired. Now he's doing uh, TV and trying to do some radio and <laughs> you trying to have a job. You no, got... well, I mean, you loot when you when your career is over, you get fired. Basically, I mean, I got cut in in uh, Arizona, and then nobody wanted to hire me. You can say I retired or I got fired. Either way, it's the same thing. Does the Turk <laughs> does the Turk come and get you, or what, what's yeah, going on with yeah, you? Yeah, I want to know through this but, process. I, I, I don't want to bring up painful I got cut memories. Twice in my career, the first time was in Miami. Okay. Uh, I was in uh, pre. It was preseason. I just had the best year of my career. I led the NFL in field goal percentage. Felt good. We were awful as a team. We went one in fifteen. I actually left your Giants law uh, <laughs> as a free agent. I had, I had the opportunity to opt out of my last year of my contract, so I opted out if I had achieved a certain categories, which I did, and signed a free agent deal with Miami. Left the Giants. The Giants won the Super Bowl. We went one in 15 in Miami. Oh. So they fired everybody. They brought in wow. Parcells and Tony Sperano and that whole crew. And they didn't like the fact that as a kicker, I was the <laughs> captain on the team. Uh, I did radio. I was the player rep. It was just all these negative marks. In fact, I'll never forget my first meeting with Tony Sperano. I went in after he got hired. You know, just I was living in the area. So I went and said, hey, coach, congratulations. You know, excited to, to play for you. And he looked at me and he said, I decide who the leaders on this team are, and you're not one of the leaders. I want you to go stand in the corner and kick and not say a word. No, no way. way. Pro- like word for word, that's what he said to me. Oh, man, we got to get I, into this a little later. I went then. home and I looked at my wife and I was like, I'm not going to be on this team next year. <laughs> that's <laughs> and, incredible. And sure enough, you know, they, they brought a young guy in, Dan Carpenter, who was good. Yep. And, yep. and he kicked well and, and they got rid of me and I went up to the Jets and actually ended up being a great thing for me. Being with Rex, I had an awesome time. We had good teams there. Lost in the AFC Championship, but you know that's kind of the ride as a kicker. A lot it is is it's ebb and flow when you're on teams and you're doing well, and somebody else comes in and they don't want to spend money at the position, or they want a younger guy, or they want an older guy, and, and you see those all the time. You saw it down in Arizona this year. They went and signed Phil Dawson, who's my who's older than me. Uh, after they brought in Canizero, who's younger, they wanted a guy to come in who was making less money and who had a stronger leg for kickoffs. And then they decided this year we're going to go back. We want a guy who's older and who can make field goals. Yeah, v- and- Vinatieri wins three Super Bowls for the Patriots, and they say goodbye. And he's now played more seasons for the Colts than he has for the Isn't Patriots. That shocking? Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't he's the, he's like the ageless wonder. He keeps going. It'll be interesting this year because he had, he had McAfee kicking off for him. And that's one of the reasons why – Vinatieri was able to continue to kick and prolong his career because kicking off takes a toll on your body, on your legs, where when you don't have to do that and you don't have to practice it, it allows you just to focus on kicking field goals. That's a big asset, and they're going to have to have you know, one of their guys come in as the punter this year and, and be able to kick off as well. But we're going to get into everything. We're going to have Howard Beck coming up. Uh, we got him right now? Yeah, Howard's, Howard's actually on the line right now. We oh, got him right excellent. now. Excellent. Looking forward to talking to Howard, talking about the NBA. Uh, Howard, are you on there? I'm here. Excellent. We got Howard. This is his 20th year covering the NBA. He's going to talk to us everything about uh, the MVP, what's going on with resting players. Howard, I can't wait to have you on here. He is the senior NBA writer at Bleacher Report. Howard, thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. So, Howard, let's start with – uh, what Kobe said this weekend about the league having co-MVPs. I, I never like that. I don't like when you break it up and you, you can't decide one or the other. For me, it's Russell Westbrook. But what do you think about this MVP, MVP race and who do you think is the front runner and who you think deserves that award? Yeah, the, the co-MVP thing is, is like a cute idea, Kobe, but they just, it, it, it doesn't actually work that way mathematically. Like, we, we all fill out individual ballots. There's over 100 of us filling out ballots. Like, you couldn't, you couldn't create that intentionally if you wanted to. Um, to me, James Harden is clearly the MVP, and I do say clearly the MVP. Uh, the NBA has a, a long tradition of this. It's not, uh, you know, written in the rules anywhere. It's un, unspoken or, uh, you know, it's an unstated thing, but... You, there's 30, 35 years here where the MVP has come from a team that's top two or three in its conference and that wins at least 50 games. And Russell Westbrook's team is not going to win 50 games, and they're not t- top two or three in the conference. They're not a contender. And the MVP, if you want to loosely define it, and everyone's got their own definition, but my loose definition is uh, that it is a combination of individual excellence and team success. And the Rockets are a, a legit contender in the West. I don't know if they're going to beat the Warriors if they meet them in, in, this, in a series in the, in the conference finals, but they're a legit powerhouse, and they have a historically great offense. James Harden is the engine of that offense, and his numbers 
rival or exceed those of Westbrook. And just the, 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 the magic or the perceived magic of the triple-double average doesn't do it for me when you fall short in other areas. And, and one of those areas, by the way, is that the Thunder's offense, for all of Westbrook's uh, fireworks, the Thunder's offense is middle of the pack to below average. Uh, I think they're somewhere between like 15th and 17th in offensive efficiency. So it's just not having an impact. And the MVP award is about not just your greatness, but the impact it has. And that's on the win totals and on your team's offensive ranking. And, and Harden is, is far and away better than Westbrook in terms of what he's uh, producing for his team and what his team is doing because of it. So, Howard, given Westbrook's dominance with the triple-doubles and everything he does all over the field, and just like you said, the lack of production offensively from everybody else on that team, doesn't that speak to the greatness of Westbrook and what he's done this year? No one's questioning his greatness, but this is the MVP trophy we're talking about. And as I said, there, there are two components. You have the individual excellence, which Harden has, Westbrook has, LeBron James has, uh, Steph Curry has. You, you've got a bunch of guys who you can point to for individual excellence. The other component is team success. The Thunder don't have it. So to me, it's, it's end of, of argument right there, unless we're going to buck 30, 35 years of tradition and say, well, you know, he averaged a triple-double and the numbers are really impressive, so let's throw everything else out the window and the team's results don't matter. The other part of that, too, though, is, listen, yes, there are guys who's uh, individual excellence is that much more impressive when you look at the surrounding cast and you say, well, you know, where would they be without him? But that's the case for every great player on some level. They're always, the team's always going to dip a little bit when you take away a James Harden or a Kobe Bryant or a Michael Jordan or a Kevin Durant. It, just because they'd all of a sudden be a losing team as opposed to a lower tier playoff team or something, we're, we're, we're kind of splitting hairs and we're also creating a lot of guesswork. Um, and Westbrook's surrounding cast isn't that bad. Um, this is the, the core of a team that, that was you know, still a, a deep playoff team last year, granted with, with Durant on it. Um, and Harden's supporting cast, is there's no, there are no all-stars there. Their second-best player was Dwight Howard. He left, and they got <laughs> better. And guys like Clint Capella are having career years. So credit to James Harden for lifting up his supporting cast in a way that I'm not sure Westbrook really has. Well, you make a good argument, Howard, and I'm with you. I don't like the co-MVPs at all. But to me, the MVP, I don't really care about that. I mean, it's a nice award, and it's deserving for the guy who wins it. But what I care about, you know, is the playoffs. And I'm, I'm the casual NBA fan who, who really starts watching in the playoffs. And when you look at the Eastern Conference, who's the number one seed at the end of the year? And, Howard, does it really matter who the number one seed is? Is it, is it Cleveland, and it doesn't matter if they're at home, if they have home court advantage or not? What's your opinion on that? If the Cavaliers get their stuff together, um, which it's not at the moment, they're, they're defensively they're a disaster right now, they're struggling. Um, if the Cavs are the Cavs when the playoffs start, then no, I don't think it matters whether they're the first seed, second seed, wherever. Uh, you know, all, all it means ultimately is that there's one series where you might have to win one road game <laughs> to, to win a series. It's not some – you know, steep climb, right? And the sure. Cavaliers are a team. Look, the Cavs, Who did it Cavs last won the year. championship. Right. Yeah, they won the championship in game seven in Oakland. Um, I'm not worried about the Cavs being able to win a road game if they're not the number one seed. What I am concerned about for them, if I were a Cavs fan, um, I would be concerned about the fact that they've had the second worst defense in the NBA since the All Star break. That's the concern. The concern is can they flip the switch? Uh, and and get back to the dominant defense that they were known for when they were winning the championship. Because if not, it doesn't matter whether they're first, second, third, wherever uh, in the uh, in the seedings, they're going to lose. Um, there are some decent teams in the East, not as dominant, not as packed with with stars, but Washington's a very good team and just beat the, the Cavs the other night. Boston's a very good team. Toronto, when they get Kyle Lowry back, uh, will be a very good team. Those are teams that are capable of beating Cleveland if Cleveland is not at its sharpest. And right now, the Cavs are not sharp. So that's the bigger concern. Sure. Well, speaking of flipping the switch, Golden State seems like they've done that. They won seven straight. They're rolling now. Steve Kerr says Kevin Durant's at least a couple weeks away from coming back. Is there any reason to have him come back before the end of the regular season and just let him wait, let him be healthy, let him be rested, and bring him back when they really need him, when they care about in the playoffs? 
you don't want to mess around too much. I mean, I'd say this in both directions, actually. You don't want to get cute and rest him too long and either lose games that you shouldn't have or put yourself in a perilous position in the first round um, by, by overestimating yourselves. But you also don't want to, you know, get, you know, too cute in the other direction and, and, and you know, play him before he's ready. So the, the key thing here is to not take into consideration any of those things. The key is to listen to your medical staff, listen to Kevin Durant, um, and figure out when he's truly ready to be back out on the court. Uh, if he's ready, then, then you, you bring him back out because timing and chemistry and all these other things that go into, uh, you know, having your, your, your team perform at its best, it, it does require guys back on the court together. And after he's missed, you know, six weeks or, or more, you're going to want him out there to get back in rhythm with everybody. They were playing, you know, incredibly dominant ball before he, he checked out, before he got injured. They've been very good without him, but you need him back and you need everybody in, in sync with each other if you want to win the championship because San Antonio is going to be tough. Houston is going to be tough. Um, you know, whoever comes out of the East. So you want, you want Durant uh, back in rhythm with guys. So whenever he's ready, truly ready, if there's no risk of re-injury, that's when you bring him back. Yeah, and I think he's so great. He's going to be able to get himself ready and prepared, whether that's through practice or playing in games. And you want him healthy when it comes playoff time. That's what matters most to that team. But that's been the story uh, of the NBA so far over the last week or so is resting players. You heard Patrick Beverly come out and say that he didn't agree with it in, in some pretty strong language. Uh, and it's been a big topic of debate. You know, should you rest players and should you uh, not play your best guys? I'm of the mindset that you do whatever's best for your team, whether that's resting a player, getting ready for the playoffs, however you feel that you prepare your team the best. I don't care if a fan is upset that your best player didn't play necessarily in a game. I'm trying to win a championship and I'm going to prepare myself that way, you know, but there's been a lot of controversy on both sides of that. Where do you stand, Howard? Well, the, the team's, to your point, Jay, the, the team's first highest commitment is to the health and welfare of its players. Um, not only whether it's what's best to win a championship, but what's best to keep your players healthy and to ensure the longevity of their, their careers. So that's, that's your first commitment. And you've made, you know, as a team, an incredible financial commitment to these guys as, as well. So it's an investment that you need to protect all that said, sports is entertainment. Um, there are customers who are paying a lot of money, especially those who are going and, and watching these games in person. But even if you uh, are simply subscribing on cable, the, those bills aren't cheap either. Um, you do owe it to your fans to give them the best product as often as possible. But, you know, that, so there's a balance here now. And in, in the past, the NBA has been satisfied to say, listen, we're not going to tell our teams how to manage the health or the rotations, uh, the, the use of their players, that's up to them to decide. Uh, but Adam Silver is you know, now getting concerned because they had back-to-back -back games recently, or back-to-back -back weeks, where a national tel nationally televised game was missing major stars, the Spurs-Warriors game and then the Cavs uh, the following week. So they've got to find the right balance. And I don't know how, to, how they do that or how to ensure that. Um, again, you, you still can't, as a league, try telling teams when and how long to play their sure, players. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's a difficult balance. They're going to talk about this at the owners' meeting uh, in another week and a half or so here in New York. We'll see what they come up with. Thanks, Howard. I appreciate it. Howard Beck, senior writer for Bleacher Report, uh, talking to us about all the NBA stuff. Uh, Howard, thanks so much for coming on the Rich Eisen Show. I am Jay Feely filling in for Rich Eisen, who is on vacation. I got a very important message for you from the National Highway Safety Administration. So listen up. If you think a train will stop if it sees your car in the tracks, you're right. It will about a mile after it hits you. That's because it takes a train traveling 55 miles per hour about a mile to come to a screeching halt. So even though the engineer driving the train might see you, they won't see you in time to prevent the train from slamming into your car, which could result in you losing your life which surprisingly happens a lot more than you think. People try to beat the train across the tracks a lot more. In 2015, there was 230 people killed at railroad crossings. So the next time you have somewhere to be and you see a train approaching, don't take your chances trying to beat it. It's not worth the few minutes you have to gain. A statistics show you might lose. Stop because the trains can't. For more information, go to www.transportation.gov backslash stop dash trains dash can't. 
That's right, Jay. We're gonna uh, we're gonna catch a quick break here. When we come back, though, we're gonna break down some of the new NFL rule proposals with you. A couple of them involving kickers and Peter King on the backside to talk about uh, what's going on with Oakland. That's all here on the Rich Eisen Show with Jay Feely filling in.